Once there was a gentleman who married for his second wife, the proudest and most haughty woman that was ever seen. She had, by a former husband, two daughters of her own humor, who were indeed exactly like her in all things. He had likewise, by another wife, a young daughter, but of unparalleled goodness and sweetness of temper, which she took from her mother, who was the best creature in the world. No sooner were the ceremonies of the wedding over, but the mother-in-law began to show herself in her true colors. She could not bear the good qualities of this pretty girl, and less because they made her own daughters appear the more odious. She employed her in the meanest work of the house. She scoured the dishes, tables, etc., and scrubbed Madame's chamber and those of Mrs., her daughters. She lay up in a sorry garret upon a wretched straw bed, while her sisters lay in fine rooms with floors all inlaid upon beds of the very newest fashion, and where they had looking-glasses so large that they might see themselves at their full length from head to foot. The poor girl bore all patiently, and dared not tell her father, who would have rattled her off, for his wife governed him entirely. When she had done her work, she used to go into the chimney corner and sit down among the cinders and ashes, which made her commonly be called Cinder Winch. But the youngest, who was not so rude and uncivil as the eldest, called her Cinderella. However, Cinderella, notwithstanding her mean apparel, was a hundred times handsomer than her sisters, though they were always dressed very richly. It happened that the king's son gave a ball and invited all persons of fashion to it. Our young misses were also invited, for they cut a very grand figure among the quality. They were mightily delighted at this invitation, and wonderfully busy in choosing out such gowns, petticoats, and headclothes as might become them. This was a new trouble to Cinderella, for it was she who ironed her sister's linen and plaited their ruffles. They talked all day long of nothing but how they should be dressed. For my part, said the eldest, I wear my red velvet suit with French trimming. And I, said the youngest, shall have my usual petticoat, but then, to make amends for that, I will put on my gold-flowered sash and my diamond stomacher, which is far from being the most ordinary one in the world. They sent for the best tire woman they could get to make up their headdresses and adjust their double pinners, and they had their red brushes and patches from Mademoiselle de la Proix. Cinderella was likewise called up to them to be consulted in all these matters, for she had excellent notions, and advised them always for the best, nay, and offered her services to dress their heads, which they were very willing she should do. As she was doing this, they said to her, Cinderella, would you not be glad to go to the ball? Glass, said she, you only jeer me, for it is not such as I am to go thither. Thou art right of that, they replied. It would make the people laugh to see a cinder wench at a ball. Anyone but Cinderella would have dressed their heads awry, but she was very good and dressed them perfectly well. They went almost two days without eating, so much that they were transported with joy. They broke above a dozen laces in trying to be laced up close, that they might have a finer, slender shape, and they were continually at their looking-glass. At last the happy day came. They went to court, and Cinderella followed them with her eyes as long as she could, and when she had lost sight of them, she fell a-crying. Her godmother, who saw her all in tears, asked her what was the matter. I wish I could, I wish I could. She was not able to speak the rest, being interrupted by her tears and sobbing. This godmother of hers, who was a fairy, said to her, Thou wishest thou couldst go to the ball, is it not so? Yes, cried Cinderella with a great sigh. Well, said the godmother, be but a good girl, and I will contrive that thou shalt go. Then she took her into her chamber and said, Run into the garden and bring me a pumpkin. Cinderella went immediately to gather the finest she could get and brought it to her godmother, not being able to imagine how this pumpkin could make her go to the ball. 
Her godmother scooped out all of the inside, having left nothing but the rind, which done, she struck it with her wand, and the pumpkin was instantly turned into a fine coach, gilded all over with gold. She then went to look into her mouse trap, where she found six mice, all alive, and ordered Cinderella to lift up a little the trap door, when, giving each mouse, as it went out, a little tap with her wand, the mouse was at that moment turned into a fine horse, which altogether made a very fine set of six horses of a beautiful mouse-colored dapple gray. Being at a loss for a coachman, I will go and see, says Cinderella, if there is never a rat in the rat trap, we may make a coachman of him. Thou art in the right, replied her godmother. Go and look. Cinderella brought the trap to her, and in it there were three huge rats. The fairy made choice of one of the three, which had the largest beard, and having touched him with her wand, he was turned into a fat, jolly coachman, who had the smartest whiskers eyes ever beheld. After that, she said to her, Go again into the garden, and you will find six lizards behind the watering pot. Bring them to me. She had no sooner done so, but her godmother turned them into six footmen, who skipped up immediately behind the coach, with their liveries all bedaubed with gold and silver, and clung as close behind each other as if they had done nothing else their whole lives. The fairy then said to Cinderella, well, you see here an equipage fit to go to the ball with. Are you not pleased with it? Oh, yes, he cried, but must I go thither as I am in these nasty rags? Her godmother only just touched her with her wand, and at the same instant her clothes were turned into cloth of gold and silver all beset with jewels. This done, she gave her a pair of glass slippers, the prettiest in the whole world. Being thus decked out, she got up into her coach, but her godmother, above all things, commanded her not to stay till after midnight, telling her at the same time that if she stayed one moment longer, the coach could become a pumpkin again, her horses mice, her coachman a rat, her footmen lizards, and her clothes become just as they were before. She promised her godmother she would not fail of leaving the ball before midnight, and then Away she drives, scarce able to contain herself for joy. The king's son, who was told that a great princess, whom nobody knew, was come, ran out to receive her. He gave her his hand as she alighted out of the coach and led her into the ball among all the company. There was immediately a profound silence. They left off dancing, and the violins ceased to play, so attentive was every one to contemplate the singular beauties of the unknown newcomer. Nothing was then heard but a confused noise of, Ha! How handsome she is! Ha! How handsome she is! The king himself, old as he was, could not help watching her and telling the queen softly that it was a long time since he had seen so beautiful and lovely a creature. All the ladies were busied in considering her clothes and headdress that they might have some made the next day after the same pattern, provided they could meet with such fine material and as able hands to make them. The king's son conducted her to the most honorable seat and afterward took her out to dance with him. She danced so gracefully that they all more and more admired her. A fine collation was served up, whereof the young prince ate not a morsel, so intently was he busied in gazing on her. She went and sat down by her sisters, showing them a thousand civilities, giving them part of the oranges and citrons which the prince had presented her with, which very much surprised them, for they did not know her. While Cinderella was thus amusing her sisters, she heard the clock strike eleven and three quarters whereupon she immediately made a curtsy to the company and hasted away as fast as she could. When she got home, she ran to seek out her godmother, and after having thanked her, she said she could not but heartily wish she might go next day to the ball because the king's son had desired her. As she was eagerly telling her godmother whatever had passed at the ball, her two sisters knocked at the door, which Cinderella ran and opened. How long you've stayed, cried she, gaping, rubbing her eyes, and stretching herself as if she had just waked out of her sleep. She had not, however, any manner of inclination to sleep since they went from home. 
If thou hadst been at the ball, said one of her sisters, thou wouldst not have been tired with it. There came thither the finest princess, the most beautiful ever was seen with mortal eyes. She showed us a thousand civilities and gave us oranges and citrons. Cinderella seemed very indifferent to the matter. Indeed, she asked them the name of that princess, but they told her they did not know it, and that the king's son was very uneasy on her account, and would give all the world to know who she was. At this, Cinderella, smiling, replied, She must then be very beautiful indeed. How happy you have been! Could not I see her? Ah, dear Miss Charlotte, do lend me your yellow suit of clothes which you wear every day. Ah, to be sure! cried Miss Charlotte. Lend my clothes to such a dirty cinder wench as thou art. I should be a fool. Cinderella, indeed, expected well such answer, and was very glad of the refusal. For she would have been sadly put to it if her sister had lent her what she asked for jestingly. The next day the two sisters were at the ball, and so was Cinderella, but dressed more magnificently than before. The king's son was always by her, and never ceased his compliments and kind speeches to her, to whom all this was so far from being tiresome that she quite forgot what her godmother had recommended to her, so that she at last counted the clock striking twelve when she took it to be no more than eleven. She rose up and fled as nimble as a deer. The prince followed but could not overtake her. She left behind one of her glass slippers, which the prince took up most carefully. She got home, but quite out of breath, and in her nasty old clothes, having nothing left of her of all the finery but one of the little slippers, fell out to the one she had dropped. The guards at the palace gate were asked if they had not seen the princess go out, who said they had seen nobody go out but a young girl very meanly dressed, and who had more the air of a poor country wench than a gentlewoman. When the two sisters returned from the ball, Cinderella asked them if they had been well diverted and if the fine lady had been there. They told her, Yes, but she hurried away immediately when it struck twelve, and with so much haste that she dropped one of her little glass slippers, the prettiest in the world, which the king's son had taken up, that he had done nothing but look at her all the time at the ball, and that most certainly he was very much in love with the beautiful person who owned the glass slipper. What they said was very true, for a few days after the king's son caused it to be proclaimed by the sound of trumpet that he would marry her whose foot the slipper would just fit. They whom he employed began to try it upon the princesses, then the duchesses, and all the court, but in vain. It was brought to the two sisters, who did all they possibly could do to thrust their feet into the slipper, but they could not effect it. Cinderella, who saw all this and knew her slipper, said to them, laughing, Let me see if it will not fit me. Her sisters burst out laughing and began to banter her. The gentleman who was sent to try the slipper looked earnestly at Cinderella, and, finding her very handsome, said, It was but just that she should try, and that he had orders to let every one make trial. He obliged Cinderella to sit down, and putting the slipper to her foot, he found it went on very easily, and fitted her as if it had been made of wax. The astonishment her two sisters were in was excessively great, but still abundantly greater when Cinderella pulled out of her pocket the other slipper and put it on her foot. Thereupon in came her godmother, who, having touched with her wand Cinderella's clothes, made them richer and more magnificent than any of those she had had before. And now her two sisters found her to be that fine, beautiful lady whom they had seen at the ball. They threw themselves at her feet to beg pardon for all the ill treatment they had made her undergo. Cinderella took them up, and as she embraced them, cried that she forgave them with all her heart, and desired them always to love her. She was conducted to the young prince, dressed as she was, he thought her more charming than ever, and after a few days married her. Cinderella, who was no less good than beautiful, gave her two sisters lodgings in the palace.